Get Rich Education is brought to you by Audible. More than 150,000 audiobooks to choose from for your mobile device. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to Get Rich Education, show 23. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. My wife is back from Asia to cook for me again, so I did stave off abject starvation. We release a new Get Rich Education episode every Friday. In the United States, a fresh show is published Fridays at 8 a.m. If you're in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, in New York City, where we've got a great listenership, that's 7 a.m. If you're in Chicago or Houston in the Central Time Zone, same time for those listeners in Central America, which we have a handful of. The show is released at 6 a.m. Fridays. If you're in Durango, Colorado, it's a 5 a.m. release. For those driving the 405 between Santa Monica and Long Beach, we've got a great Coastal California listenership, too. That's 4 a.m. if you're in beautiful and pristine Anchorage, Alaska. And it's even earlier than that if you're in Lahaina, Hawaii. They don't observe daylight saving time in Hawaii, so your Hawaii release time will differ an hour depending on the time of year. Hey, did you know that Robert Kiyosaki bought his first ever rental property in Lahaina, Hawaii, there on Maui's west coast? Robert Kiyosaki and I were in the same room last month, and he mentioned that fact. Lahaina is also where your Get Rich Education host took his first ever surfing lessons a few years ago, and I loved it. (laughs) Well, hey, we've got perhaps the world's most famous podcaster on the show today, and that is Entrepreneur on Fire's John Lee Dumas. That ought to be great. Before I bring you that, if you're new to the show, I'm not an analyst. I'm not a consultant. I'm doing investments like what I feature on the show myself, and I'm here to help you do it too. Look, I would never call any person a nobody. Everybody has value in this world, but I know sometimes when people are down on their luck, they call themselves a nobody. Well, I want to turn more nobodies into somebody than anybody. That's what I'm doing with this show. I'm turning more nobodies into somebody than anybody. Many of these investments featured on the show are those that the wealthy participate in, yet most anyone can participate. That's why I'm bringing them to you, and I'm just giving it all away. You can use my network, use my contacts. I'm bringing those contacts right onto the show. Doing this for you doesn't diminish me at all. It's great to be a connector. Each of the previous two weeks, it was pretty fun to niche down into the Anchorage and Dallas real estate markets and bring you very actionable content served on a platter, just like we did with our great Dallas provider, Jay Hartley, last week. Look for real estate markets with sustainable job growth. That's where your tenants' income comes from, and tenants are where your rent income comes from. That's why in investment real estate, the market is more important than the property. I expect real estate returns of 25% per year every year at the least, at the worst. I mean, anything less than that would be totally disappointing. Well, a good manager, property manager is more important than the property too. I often joke that property management ought to be called tenant management and that tenant management can make you lose faith in humanity. You know, I managed my own properties for five and a half years, which was too long, by the way. It takes a certain temperament to deal with tenants. Most landlords either come down too hard on tenants or too soft on tenants. If you crack down too hard on a tenant for something, they'll be upset with you and then they're no fun to deal with. But if you come down too easy on a tenant, they'll walk all over you, pay the rent late, and hide a dog inside their property when one isn't allowed on the lease, okay? There are very few special people with that firm yet friendly temperament. That's part of what makes a good manager. And speaking of friendly, a simple way to think of dealing with tenants that you're self-managing is this. Be friendly, but not friends. That 
can at least increase the chances that you will stay inside the hard and soft zones. It still just sort of takes a certain personality, but when it comes to your tenants, it will help if you remember, be friendly, not friends. Well, with serving actionable content on a platter here with some of these turnkey real estate provider episodes lately, you know, I'm really picky with whom I have on the show. I want to vet everyone on some level before they're here. Otherwise, I'm doing you, my listener, a disservice. I'm looking at integrity, track record, and having them represent a good market. Do your own due diligence, though, and listen to the disclaimer at the end of the show, okay? Not only am I picky with whom I have on the show, I arrange my episodes in a certain order so that you have appropriate context before your delivered content. For example, global economist Richard Duncan appeared here on the show, so you had a long, big picture macroeconomic view. Then next, I did a show about what to look for in a real estate market in general. And then in the next show, we niched it down with Terry Kerr in one specific Memphis, Tennessee market. We took things from big to small. Then also, a couple months ago, attorney Garrett Sutton appeared on the show to tell you how to protect your assets one week before Judy Robinette was on Get Rich Education to tell you how to get money for your deal. I want you to have a resource so that you can protect what you have before you get the money because I want you to keep what you get. This is not get rich quick education. I know you're hearing ideas here and you're being connected directly to the contacts that can potentially change your life. It's exciting. I want it presented in a responsible order and fashion so that you're protected and that your wealth building is sustainable. You might think that my turnkey provider guests, you know, you might think they always say glowing things about their market. Likely, they often do. Well, they often should because I'm just not planning to feature any geographic market providers on the show anytime soon in markets where there are job losses. That would undercut the durability of rental income streams. And one reason I favor keeping a Friday release schedule for the shows is that when you get an investment idea or contact on the show, that you are more likely to have a cooling period over the weekend and you're less likely to jump into something without thinking it over or talking it over first. I know people listen to the show on different days, but Friday release day is a big listener day as there are often limited inventories of these popular, actionable investing ideas here. Okay, so hey, for the rest of the show, we're going to pivot into a different tangent here, podcasting. As a listener, you might wonder what it's like to be on the other side of the microphone like I am. Podcasting has been a lot more work than I anticipated. However, I do seem to have a lot more listenership than I expected. You know, all this extra work really became apparent after about 12 episodes. I talked with my family and decided, yes, I plan to keep doing the show for the very long term. Besides more work and time involved over the four to five months since the show began, even with an advertiser, my show expenses are greater than the small income. It's a money loser, which is not a big problem for me. I'd love to say that I'm even working for $5 an hour on this show, but I know I don't get paid that much. It's negative something an hour. And no guest pays me to appear on the show. I would have to question if that would even be responsible journalism. That would likely just devolve into infomercialism and be apparent. Oh, and I also don't pay any guests to appear on the show. You know, really, most podcasts are money losers. And they take a lot of time, but they can provide you with a sense of giving back to others. Most podcasts never have lucrative advertising ever. But, you know, an interesting thing happened to me. After my very first episode back in October, a broker from a company that I'm an investor in heard the show. That first Get Rich Education episode was just me on the microphone for about 30 minutes. After he heard it, he texted me and basically said that they, their company there, would like to advertise on Get Rich Education because they believe in my message of spreading wealth to others so much. Well, I declined. At that time, after just a week of being out, my show was getting about 20 downloads per week. It was a friends and family show. 
Two weeks later, that same company representative, that broker, contacted me again about wanting to advertise on my show, and I deferred again. I only had about 100 show downloads per week, and I knew the sponsor would not have a good return on investment. Uh, By the way, I'm sure most any podcast would have said yes to this deal then, but I didn't see where I was providing the advertiser with any value. A couple months into the show, they asked again, and I accepted. Now, It was rare to have a good advertiser at all, let alone having them beat on my door asking to be let in. Now, the Get Rich Education podcast expenses still exceed income, even considering the advertising. But you know what made the difference in having an advertiser contact me? I mean, this is really a lesson you can use for real estate investing. Again, it's the power of relationships. When I go out there and invest in a company or a syndication or a specific geographic real estate market, I like to sit down face to face and get to know my provider. Now, Skype is great. I use Skype all the time, but it still doesn't replace that feeling and trust that you have from actually being around a person. They seem more real to you and you seem more real to them. They trust you more. You trust them more. My sponsor knew I was going to deliver the ads that I said I would, and they knew that I'm providing listeners with something valuable too. They made a bet that listenership would grow. My sponsor sees me at investing events regularly. Those that go to events are more likely to be reputable people too. Why is that? Well, no known con artist or cheater would want to go to events to get around people because people wouldn't want to be around them. It would be uncomfortable. So go to events. Build your relationships in your network, just like you and everyone else. I don't know anyone until I meet them. I don't know anyone until I meet them, just like you. So, hey, well, my next guest, John Lee Dumas, has told me that 90% of new podcasts don't make it past episode seven. Yeah, that's because there is a lot of work involved either planning some material for a show or lining up guests for a show and delivering it all in an organized way, finding a good and dependable show editor, how to use the best calendar and autoresponder systems, learning about how to do your podcast hosting, how to expose your show to more people. Another reason podcasts fail is that most people don't plan well. John Lee Dumas is the foremost authority in the world with Helping Others podcast. John is the founder and host of the very popular Entrepreneur on Fire podcast, bringing you stories of inspiring entrepreneurs every day. Yes, he does the show seven days a week. Before John even launched his show in 2012, he reached out to and paid the best podcasting mentors. Now, some of John's prominent mentors told him, no, seven days a week is too often, thinking that John would burn out with that approach. I personally cannot imagine podcasting seven days per week with all the work that a a one-day-a-week show takes. John Lee Dumas had a long planning runway of a couple months to set up all his systems. His podcast now has over a million downloads a month and growing. Podcasters look up to John as a model to emulate. He's revolutionized podcasting with his systems and hundreds of thousands of dollars of monthly income, yes, monthly income from podcasting. John also runs Podcasters Paradise, an online community filled with passionate podcasters. He's got video tutorials, and there's a lot more that will help one create, grow, and monetize their podcast. And that greatly increases one's chances of having a successful podcast. Hey, I can tell you, if you know someone that's interested in podcasting, Podcasters Paradise should be their first stop. I asked John to appear on Get Rich Education. That's coming up after the break. And I'll ask John about real estate and investing too. You knew I couldn't resist that. It's JLD on GRE right when we come back. For Get Rich Education listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. My pick is Garrett Sutton's Loopholes of Real Estate. That shows you the tax and legal strategies used by the rich for generations to benefit from real estate investments. I read the book myself. Loopholes of Real Estate tells you how to open tax loopholes for your benefit and close legal loopholes for your protection. 
I like chapter three where Garrett makes the knowledge dynamite boom on real estate leverage and cash flow. I don't say this often, but it's one of the best real estate investing books I've ever read. If that's not enough, you get Garrett's own voice reading the audiobook, and Get Rich Education listeners get it free. To get yours, go to audibletrial.com slash getricheducation. This is Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton. To grow your wealth, listen to the always valuable Get Rich Education. If you're a regular podcast listener, chances are you've heard of this week's guest. John Lee Dumas is the founder and host of Entrepreneur on Fire, awarded the best of iTunes 2013. Hey, if you haven't heard the Entrepreneur on Fire podcast, you really ought to check out his enormously popular show. John interviews today's most inspiring and successful entrepreneurs seven days a week, and he has been featured in Forbes, Inc., and Time Magazine. John has turned Entrepreneur on Fire into a business that generates over $200,000 a month. John also founded the number one podcasting community in the world, that's Podcaster's Paradise. Entrepreneur on Fire generates over 850,000 unique listens every month. John Lee Dumas, are you prepared to ignite? Keith, you beat me to the punch. (laughs) Yes, let's burn this place down. Hey, well, you know, you've got such an interesting uh, story in how you got to be such a popular podcaster. I think a lot of podcasters use a podcast as sort of a supplement to their existing business. And that's certainly what I do with your investing. So, you know, one thing that I think we share in common is I really try to cultivate an abundance mentality for investing here. And you certainly must have had an abundance mentality to have the audacity to go launch a podcast and get so big so fast. So I'd like to ask, you know, what's your origin story? How did you quickly get to be one of the best known podcasters in the world, John? Well, absolutely. To talk about your abundance mentality, I believe we can have one of the two that are scarcity. And that scarcity mindset is unfortunately where 95% of the population lives. And if you're in that 5% of abundance, you know you're never going back. It's just such a better place to live and breathe for so many reasons, which we can definitely get into. But a real quick rundown of my origin story. I'm just a country boy from the state of Maine. For the first 18 years of my life, I grew up there and went to college on an Army ROTC scholarship. So I spent the ages of 22 to 26 as an active duty officer with a 13-month tour of duty thrown in there to Iraq. Then I was in the reserves from 26 to 30, and that was what I call my struggling 20s because I was trying a bunch of different careers. I went to law school, quit after one semester, corporate finance with John Hancock. After just 18 months, I was dying a slow death, suffocating in that cubicle, so I walked out the door. So then I tried real estate. I was in real estate for four years, both commercial and residential, both in San Diego and back in Maine. So I definitely know the real estate world, and I loved a lot of it, but it wasn't my true calling. Like Deep down, I knew there was something else that really lit my fire. And that ended up being podcasting. And there I was at 32 years old. So there's a full six years of struggling in these different careers. And I'm at 32 years old driving around all the time in a car, like I'm sure many people that are listening right now, because that's what we do in real estate. We drive a lot. And I listen to podcasts and I loved them. And my favorites were listening to interviews with inspiring and successful entrepreneurs and hearing their journey, starting with their failures, then moving into their aha moments, and then really getting inside their heads as to why they're successful right now. But there was no podcast out there that was doing this on a quantity and consistency level that I needed. I was in the car every single day, like most people are, Keith, but podcasts were coming out once a week, once every two weeks at most. And you use the word audacity, which I do love. I feel like I did have the audacity to say, you know what? If I want this, somebody else must too. Entrepreneur on Fire was born, seven-day-a-week podcast delivering a new, inspiring, successful interview with an incredible entrepreneur seven days a week. And here we are, 850 episodes later. We've been awarded Best of iTunes. We get over a million unique listens every single month, and we're growing at a rapid rate. And yeah, the income's pretty solid as well. Uh, we do over $250,000 in monthly revenue at this point, and we actually share all of our 
our numbers at eofire.com slash income just because we love being transparent about where that money comes from so others can emulate our successes and avoid our failures because we make a lot of those too. And that's where we get to today, Keith. Well, you've clearly shown that you're a person that's not afraid of failure. And not having a fear of failure is such an important element to being a successful entrepreneur. They say the best entrepreneurs often fail frequently, fail fast, and fail forward. And as you were telling me about your journey and the different careers and things you tried, you showed that you weren't afraid to fail. In entrepreneurship, failure can actually be a blessing, but we just weren't brought up that way. In school, if you failed, you got an F and you were embarrassed. In politics, if you fail, you know, there's probably going to be a congressional investigation. (laughs) (laughs) So failure in podcasting uh, can be a good thing. And, you know, I know. Well, Keith, let me real quick. Let me just make a point because I do agree with that. I really do. But I personally like to look at it in another way. I really am a big believer that we need to stop having fear of quitting. That's what I think was one thing that we have. We have this fear of quitting because, oh, I've invested so much time in this master's degree or I've been in this job for three years. Like we have this fear of quitting. And that's one thing that I really feel like the military brought to me was the courage to quit, to know when the chips are down. Because, hey, when, when there's bullets flying and there's lies on the line, you need to have the courage to admit when you're wrong and to quit and to go on to something else. And I was taught that at a very young age as a leader of 16 men in four tanks in a war, 12 of which made it home. So four made the ultimate sacrifice. And, you know, that's something that I always look back and say, man, like these heroes, you know, did what they had to do for this country. I refuse to dishonor their sacrifice by living anything less than I deserve to be living and that I want to be living and what I can give to this world. And when that took the courage to quit and, and walk away from law school, I had that courage. When I took the courage to quit a six-figure job in corporate finance, even though we were in the midst of the worst recession, I had that courage. So I like to term it that way. Have, you know, stop having the fear of quitting. Have the courage to quit because that's what's going to give you the opportunities. Yeah, when you have that frame of reference and you can weigh success and failure on the battlefield, when there's lives on the line, that must have given you a great perspective to have less fear of failure going on when there are not lives on the line. Huge. I know that when you began, you did a great job of surrounding yourself with good mentors. And a lot of those good mentors told you, John, putting out one podcast every day is too much, but you flew in the face of that as well. (laughs) And see, I think this is really important as well. When I was hearing my mentors, people that I looked up to and respected, Cliff Ravenscraft, the podcast answer man, Jamie Tardy, the eventual millionaire, who's my one-on-one direct mentor, they gave me so much value. I invested heavily in myself financially, and they gave me so much value back, which I used to really jump off to a great start with podcasting. But when they told me, John, a seven-day-a-week podcast is not going to work, I put my blinders on there, and I I listened to them, but I didn't let it affect my vision, my goal, because my intuition, my gut was telling me this was something that needed to be done. And I actually even got a little bit excited, because I said, you know, if the top people in the industry say that it can't be done, but they don't really have a great reason why, they just say it can't be done, then man, if somebody can actually do it, there's the opportunity, and I want to be that podcaster. So we've talked about failure a little bit. What would you point to as really your greatest success so far? I think my greatest success by far is perseverance. Because when I started, man, was I a bad podcaster. I was a bad host. I had no experience. I was awkward. I was robotic. I just didn't have any skills. But, you know, I persevered because I knew the truth of the quote. If you want to be, do. I wanted to be a podcaster. I had to flip in podcast. There was no other way around it. I had to be willing to be bad to eventually get good. And it took me 50, 60 episodes before I even started getting just kind of bad, not just plain old bad. I was now I was just kind of bad. I was like, yes, it's awesome being not bad. It's awesome being just kind of bad. And then I continued to progress. And here we are 850 episodes later for my show, hundreds on other shows I've been a podcaster now for thousands and thousands of hours, and I'm still improving every single day. You're really a podcasting pioneer. You sort of pushed the frontier out there with 
monetization and listenership really to where few, if any, have ever put it. What's your greatest motivator? What really continues to drive you to go ahead and keep pushing the limits of that frontier? <laughs> For some reason, when you were saying that, I was picturing like the Star Wars quote that coming in, like the new frontiers, or maybe that was Star Trek, the new frontiers go where no man has gone before. So maybe we can cue that in to the, uh, to the interview here. But that is a great question. Like, what is my biggest motivator? Now that I've had a seven figure year, we did two and a half million dollars in revenue in 2014, where our listenership now eclipses a million unique listens per month. You know, I've won a podcast awards, been featured in magazines. Like what's my biggest motivator now? And I can tell you in two words, ripple effects. My favorite emails, Keith, are not from people that email me and say, John, your podcast inspired me to take action. And I did took, take action and my life is just so much better now. Now, don't get me wrong. I love those emails. I absolutely love them, but they're not my favorite because my favorites are when that same person emails me maybe six months later and says, John, remember when I told you I took action? Well, I did. I've continued to do so. And look at this email that I received today from another person who heard about me through my efforts. And now I've changed their lives. So now I have somebody, Keith, who I'm looking at, who I inspire to go out and take massive action. And now they're inspiring this third degree of separation, some person that would never have heard of me, never heard of Entrepreneur on Fire, but now that person's life is so much better and has been changed in such a powerful and positive way, all because of that ripple effect. And that's what keeps me going. Yeah, and that's sort of a line between success and significance. Often in traditional business, one achieves success early on, but do they ever get to the point of significance? Do they ever get to the point of giving back? With podcasting, you might be putting significance before success. You're significant because you're reaching so many listeners, and then pretty soon you backfill that with some success as you get more listenership, more sponsors, and more attention. So can you talk a little bit to the interplay between significance and and success? So I've only had 24 repeat guests of my now over 850 interviews. And one of the guests that I've had who is a repeat is a guy by the name of Aaron Walker. And he talks about that point so eloquently. And I love it because we do as entrepreneurs, if we work hard and we're lucky and we all the stars align, yes, we do find success. And that's amazing and it feels great. But then how do we move from that success to actual significance? That's such a critical interplay there because success just with itself can get hollow and can lose its meaning after a while, but significance never will. Because if you're really being significant, you're having a really powerful impact and hopefully growing your legacy that will live beyond you. And and that's really, really powerful. So, you know, there's a great quote by Earl Nightingale that I love, which is success is the gradual realization of a worthy ideal. And what I love about that quote is the words gradual and worthy. So many people are just looking for that finish line. Like if I just get there, you know, it's a 65 years old, I can retire and I'll be getting $2,000 a month in pension and then I can just really be happy. Like, no, like this is the journey we're on. It's gradually realizing not just any ideal, but a worthy ideal. So if you're listening, I mean, think about those words. Like, are you gradually realizing a worthy ideal? If not, why not? If not now, why not now? And start taking action. Have that courage to circle things back, to quit whatever you're doing that's not that, and start something that is. Yeah, I like how you've introduced the word worthy because I've been podcasting about four months and I'm definitely getting listener mail saying, we love your podcast, we love your show. Well, in a few more months, I hope to be getting some of those messages that you've been getting, John, since you've been doing this longer. I want to get those messages from people that say, you did change my life and I did go buy a turnkey real estate investment and it is providing me with passive cash flow and now my family can do things that they had never done. So, I'm still sort of trying to build that feeling of significance in people's lives. Turning the corner a little bit, you know, you've been around podcasting for quite a while now. You're clearly a successful entrepreneur. What's really the best internet resource or perhaps an app that you can recommend to our listeners, whether that's investing or business or or whatever? 
you need to control your time. Your time is by far your most valuable resource. And you need to be absolutely cognizant of that fact at all times. So often we let other people's agendas barge in and take over our day. That's email, that's Facebook notifications, that's anything you can think of that isn't mission critical to taking you a step closer to success. So an app that I want to recommend, which has been critical for me in taking back control of my life and my calendar, which was taken away from me for a while because I did allow it to, is Schedule Once. And Schedule Once is an amazing app if you're going to be scheduling even a phone call or an interview or a guest on your podcast or whatever that might be. You need to be in control of your calendar and Schedule Once ensures that you are. So for instance, when Keith reached out to me and said, John, I'd love for you to be on my show. I said, Keith, I'd be honored. I get a ton of these requests because I run Podcasters Paradise. There's over 1,900 members of people that are creating and growing and monetizing podcasts. Like, I get a lot of requests to be on other shows and I want to pay it for as much as possible. So here is my scheduling link. If any of these times work for you in the future, you know, please book them. If they don't, I totally understand and I'm sorry, but you know, I, I will be giving you a lot of options with that. They just might not be for the next few months. And sure enough, Keith, you opened it up. You found a date that works for you, plopped it in there. And then here we are a couple months later chatting. And it's, it's a great way for me to be very specific with my time. This way for Keith to be able to plan in the future. Um, and so he knows when he's having this, we can maybe plan other interviews and chats right around where, when we're talking to kind of batch those things. Because believe me, when I started off and I was emailing Tim Ferriss and Gary Vaynerchuk and getting them to say yes to Entrepreneur on Fire, I was not giving them options of when they could come on. I was saying, what time works for you? I will make it happen. Like I've canceled dentist appointments. I've done a lot of things to make, to move my schedule around. But when you get to a point where you start to turn that corner and now for instance, I get over a hundred inbound requests per month to be on Entrepreneur on Fire for just the 30 spots that we have. So I have a very detailed application system and I'm very specific. I only do interviews on Tuesdays. Here are the eight blocks. This is for my show, Entrepreneur on Fire. Here are the eight blocks that my studio time is and I hope you find one that works for you. If not, then I'm sorry. Like If you're not willing to move your schedule around, then it's not important enough for you and there's other people who will. So we're going to serve those people. And it all comes back to schedule once, you know, to kind of wrap this up with this app because it's really important to be in control of your time and that gives you the tools to do so. Now, I know that you have some real estate investing and experience, John. Tell our listeners about that. Well, you know, being a real estate guy, I definitely love my real estate, but on limited quantities because I really do want to focus on not real estate being my focal point as far as a portfolio. So I do own two places that I'm a quote unquote absentee landlord that have great systems in place. They're both cash flow positive. They have great tenants and it's been a great experience. And, and those are two places, one's in Boston, one's in Maine. And I'm out here in San Diego, but they both have been great investments for me for the years. And, and, and I've actually owned and sold multiple places before that as well. So those are my current real estate holdings, but my investments really focus now, I'd say 90% of my current wealth lies in index funds. I'm a big believer in Warren Buffett and uh, Jake Bogle of Vanguard, who are huge into index investing. I read the book uh, Money by Anthony Robbins, where he goes around and interviews the nine or 10 most respected investors. And every one of them really comes back to that point. So I've always been a big index uh, invest fund investor. I dollar cost average into them. So every 15 days, I'm putting more money into it to, to catch the ebbs and the flows of the market. And I'm a big believer in doing that on a consistent and pretty hefty basis. And that's really where a lot of my investment lies. John, it's been great to have your angle today. Thanks for coming on to Get Rich Education. Keith, thanks a lot. It's been a blast and I am prepared to ignite. You've been listening to the Get Rich Education podcast, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments.
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC exclusively.